Well, good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. I'd like to welcome any visitors. We're always grateful to have anyone uh, new come and join us to worship our God together. You picked a good Sunday to visit as we're going back in our study through Romans. We took a short hiatus for Christmas and New Year's and some different topical things through that. And now we will take back up in Romans, and we're in chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. And this is really the crescendo of all that Paul has been working toward in this epistle. And so here's the capstone of Romans chapter 8. One commentator said it's the highest plateau in the whole of divine revelation. James Boyce, the late preacher, said, we have made our way up the steep ascent of doctrine, and now we are on the peak and the experience is glorious. Take it in, look, adore, and worship. The view that we're going to look at is couched in five unanswerable questions. And these questions are things that someone might bring up, things that might be able to defeat God's plan or to harm us. John Stott said the apostle now hurls these questions out into space, as it were, defiantly, triumphantly, challenging any creature in heaven or earth or hell to answer them or to deny the truth that is contained in them. But there's no answer for nobody and nothing can harm the redeemed people of God. Nothing can break the chain that we've been studying in verses 29 through 30. We call it the chain of grace. There's nothing more secure than the believer in Christ. Nothing more secure than the believer in Jesus Christ. You are held by divine decree and the omnipotence of God. And this section has grown to mean more and more to me throughout my life. Because this, guys, is the heart of sanctification. We've been looking at sanctification. They, they had to rub it in a little bit this morning for a whole year. Romans 6, 7, and almost chapter 8. And the question is, how do I live to this God who has redeemed me, who loved me and brought me back into a relationship with him in the most amazing way through his son, Jesus Christ? And we have seen so much. In chapter 6, Paul says, how can you continue in sin you who have died to it. Don't you know that, that you've been baptized? When you were baptized, what you were in Adam, you died. And what's raised is a new creation to walk in newness of life. That beautiful verse in verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? You're not under law, but you are under grace. One of the most pregnant statements in the whole Bible. There's a way to be more holy under grace than when you're under law. Romans 7 showed that our relationship to the law has died, and we've now been joined to another, the Lord Jesus Christ, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit now does what the law could not do. It, it changes our hearts and makes us want to obey from the core of our being. And the Spirit then speaks adoption, Abba, Daddy, into our own hearts. He assures us that I am a child of God, and he puts to death remaining sin, no longer reigning, but remaining sin in the believer. By the Spirit of God, we begin to put to death the remnants and the remains of what we were in Adam. And then we saw that the Holy Spirit intercedes at the throne of grace for us. He, he prays perfectly according to the will of God for our good and our sanctification. Then we came to Romans 8, 28 through 30, and we kind of got stuck there. I apologize for that. <laughs> Let me just read it, and you'll know why we got stuck. Verse 28, we know that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And what is his purpose? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. And what made me giddy, you will remember, that the word glorified is in the past tense completed action. And so God is talking about our glorification as if it's already a done deal because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, his grace. And now... We come to the capstone of how do we live unto our God? How do we fight all the adversaries? Because all hell now is set against us. 
to steal our joy and the power of this transforming gospel in our hearts, that we're no longer under condemnation. The chapter began with that in verse 1. And now the fight is to put our minds and our consciences back under condemnation, to get us back under there, to get us under the law, to bring fresh accusations of why God should reject me and the demands of its fulfillment. That's our battle. And I want you to see something powerful in this section that we are going to have to fight. We're in a spiritual war like no other. I wish it was the, the love boat on its way to glory, but that is not. I've told you before, it's a battleship on your way to glory, the fight of faith. When Paul calls it that, it is that. It's a fight to rest in Christ alone. And that's where we've been journeying and laboring. And it's here that, that all that we've looked at for two years is now going to come to completion. It's amazing. And I want you to look at how Paul does this. Sanctification, growing in your faith, is fighting hard to live into the belief and the truth of our justification that chapters 1 through 5, that you are declared not guilty uh, by the God of the universe through the work of Jesus Christ. And now that is our foundation we've been learning to grow and live the Christian life, to be under grace and not under law so sin won't have dominion over you, to fight to be holy and pleasing to our God is a fight of faith in what is already true about us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't make it true. It is true, and we fight for it on a daily basis, or you will get knocked over in this battle. You let the gospel get away from your heart and your life and your hope and your joy, and you're a sitting duck for the enemy. So come with me and learn the great battle for our souls and holiness and all that God has given to us and the people of God. And so let, let's pray then that God will meet us in power with these five unanswerable questions. Because men, women, and children living like this will change the world and bring much glory to God. But I just want to warn you out of the gate that the fight of faith is the hardest battle that I've ever entered into. And so prayer is the place that we start because we need God to do it. But I want us all, every believer in this place, to fight the good fight of faith. To, to, to rest and live into this gospel. And that's where Paul's going to conclude this, this chapters 1 through 8 of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's go to our God. Father, I thank you for the veil that has been torn in two. I thank you, Lord, that we have full access into your presence and we're not consumed. We're loved and we're accepted and we cry, Abba, Daddy. I thank you for such a glorious gospel. And I pray now, Lord, we are going to learn how to apply it. We're going to learn how to fight for these truths and not be those that just are flipped around by the world and the devil and, and our own flesh. God, I pray this morning now that you would work deeply in Southside Bible Church. Let us understand this, let us get it, and let us learn how to fight the fight of faith. And so meet us here this morning, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, we're going to come to verse 31, the first question. If God is for us, who is against us? And he says in verse 31, is, what shall we say to these things? And, and probably the number one accusation I hear the most in my journey is doctrine is so impractical. And I want you to get this, that, that all practice where Paul's going to go for the rest of Romans is built on doctrine. And he's going to say, what then should we say to these things? You, you understand this, you get it. What do we say to all of this? And that's where Paul now will move into our practice. How do we live? And it kind of feels like this, is a, this could be the worst illustration I've ever used or the best. And I, I want you to come tell me afterwards, but it feels like the Karate Kid to me. Have you ever, has anyone seen the Karate Kid? Not Cobra Kai, Karate Kid. There's this kid named Daniel LaRusso, and he comes across the guy who I think rents out their apartment or next door, and his name is Miyagi. And Miyagi, he used to be the cook in Happy Days, if anyone ever saw that show. <laughs> Pat Morita. And Daniel wants to learn karate because he's being bullied at school. And he comes every day to learn from Miyagi. And, and he starts by painting fences, and you've got to have just the right form 
as he's painting the fences, and then he starts waxing cars and sanding decks, and he just, he comes day after day doing the same thing, and his enthusiasm starts to waver just a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm just a slave taking care of your house. You haven't even taught me karate. I want karate, and you're using me to clean, to paint your fences and stain your decks. And some of you this morning are like Daniel LaRusso. Paul is Miyagi, the wise man of God, laying a foundation to change your eternity and your life. And the day comes when Miyagi shows him that he's been laying foundations to make him a great karate student. It just clicks. And all of a sudden, he throws a punch, and he says, paint. And he, he blocks it. And he blocks the kicks. And he throws them, and he does this little side thing. And, and all of a sudden, in, in two seconds, this kid's a karate kid. <laughs> and he's been learning the foundations his whole time, scrubbing and painting. And he's like, this is a waste of time. And some of you come and tell me that with doctrine. And I'm telling you, you're the best karate kid ready to fight the good fight of faith because of all the doctrine and the foundation. So this morning, I'm going to teach you now how to kick and punch, <laughs> and throw off the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's powerful. <laughs> so what do we say to these things? God is for us. Who could be against us? Wax on, wax off. <laughs> If he who did not spare his own son delivered him up for us all, how will he not freely give us all things? Paint, blocks. And you go, now I get it. I've been learning more about how to practically live the Christian life than I ever thought. And all those detailed arguments and indicatives that we've been studying for two years were building a foundation for me to live a life that is pleasing to God. I get it. So let's go to Paul's school of soldiering this morning. Miyagi-do, if you wish. What shall we say to these things? And that these things in our immediate argument is that he foreknew you before the history of the world. He set his love on you. He predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. He called you out of death unto life by his power through the gospel. He justified you before God. And then he's going to glorify you. Grace began an eternity past, and it will carry you to eternity future. And so what should we say to these things? All of chapter 8, and some of the commentators think it goes back to Romans 1.16, the whole plan of salvation, which is what I think. What do we say to these things? All that we've been learning, get ready. What do we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? There's just three Greek words here. God for us. If God is for us, who could be against us? In the Greek, it's called a first class condition. Since God is for us, who could be against us? Commentator Cranfield said those three words sum up the gospel. God for us. If you had to ask me, Pastor, summarize the gospel, all that we've been studying, you want to hear it? God for us. Who could be against us? We spent a year wading through Romans 1 through 3, and it taught you, I want you to hear this clearly, God is against us as we come into this world born of Adam. He's against us. It said uh, in Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And then those chapters were to show you Gentile, you're guilty. Jew, you're guilty. You're all guilty and rejecting God. He throws it out in Romans 3, uh, 9. All, all peoples are under the dominion and rule of sin. Paul wants to make sure that you get this truth. But what we are taught in God's word is God is against us. And you need to get that. And you need to feel it. And you need to know why this morning. It's why you feel the way that you do. You're always walking around feeling that something's out to get you. You hear Jaws, the, the theme to it, as you walk through your life. Boom, boom. I can't remember how Jaws goes, but it... <laughs> da 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 And you, honestly, you feel that way. It always feels like something's about... Because 
God is against you. And I don't think anything worse could be true than that. Just hear that. The creator of all things. The one whom every atom and molecule submits to. The infinite power behind the whole universe. He, he holds everything in his hand. His will cannot be thwarted. No one can overtake him. He's against you. If God is against you, nothing can be for you. And that's your great need this morning if you've come in here separated from God. And what comes ringing in my ears was back to Romans 3.21 when he transitioned and he said, but now, pastor's two favorite words, God didn't leave us in that condition. But now, God has done something through his son to change that. And by faith in Christ and not by works, by believing in what Jesus has done, he said, you're justified. And when you're justified, we could use a word to describe you like this. God is for you. God is no longer against you. He's for you. That's what Jesus does. It goes from God's wrath and him being against you to now your father and he's for you. And there's no way to get from here to there but through Jesus Christ. No other way than this gospel. And you look at Romans 8, 28 through 30, and this now is what happens for those whom God is for. He brings you to glory to bless you for all of eternity. He's for you. Nothing can stop it. If God's for you, who could be against you? He's not passive. He's not cheering you on from heaven. When I used to be a swimmer, the coaches, would, every time you would take a breath, they'd walk up and down the, the side and go, stroke, stroke. And they're just trying to encourage you. That's not what God does. He's actively engaged for our good. He's intimately engaged on our behalf. I want you to hear it. He's for us, not partially. He's not dependent on how in you are. We are his interest and delight and his purpose, and he will make sure that you're glorified. So hear this. This is what your salvation is. God is for us. I've been blessed all week to just meditate and think on this phrase, and it just gets better and better and deeper and deeper and more impacting and more empowering. God is for us. And I want you to throw your name in it, child of God. God is for Ken Murphy. Stick your name in it. God is for me. Some of you can't say that this morning. He's for everyone else, but not me. I, I need to do better before God's bet for me. I have too much sin for God to be for me. Do you know what I did in my past? There's no way he's for me. Do you know what I said to my wife this week? He can't be for me yet. And that's the opposite of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That thinking will be your undoing. And so I want you to look your pastor in the eye. God is for me because of what Jesus Christ has done in him alone. I believe that with all of my heart. God is for me. What this one little phrase could do for the body of Christ. God is for us. But wait a minute, Paul takes this glorious and grandiose statement and he sets it against a phrase. If you look in verse 31, then who could be against us? And the answer is assumed, no one. And here's where I struggle, because I don't know about you, but since I've surrendered my life to Christ, I have way more people against me now than what I did before. I don't think the devil spent much time on me before. I was too easy. The world was my friend. My flesh never fought me because I just, whatever it said, I did. There was no battle. And when I got saved, all my friends from kindergarten through high school quit calling. And that's what you used to do before texting and emailing. Um, that's how you canceled somebody. And I told all my friends about Jesus, and no one was as excited as I was. I was so disappointed. 
they started making fun of me and laughing behind my back, mostly. And I grew up Catholic, and they nicknamed me Father Murphy, if you can picture that. <laughs> You'd show up at a party, Father Murphy's here. <clears throat> and then when I became a pastor and sought to preach God's Word as faithfully as I know how and not take the edge off it, the opposition has been fierce. The attacks from the enemy became very intense. Indwelling sin has been relentless. And I hear Jesus say, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. He says, I'm going to call you to suffer for my name's sake. And if you'll look at Romans 8.35, he's going to say in one of these questions, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're being put to death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And so my question is, who could be against me? I feel like everyone's against me. Octavius Winslow, I still wish that was my first son's name, but my wife hated it. <laughs> he said, the believer may be compared to an individual who has thrown off allegiance to his king, has disowned his country and refuses obedience to its laws, yet continues to dwell in that land that he has renounced. And so who could be against me? What I want you to catch then is what Paul is saying is, uh, I'm going to translate a little different. Who of any account can be against us? Who can do anything to thwart his plan of bringing many sons to glory? Who can break Romans 8, 29 through 30, the chain of grace? Who can stop God's purposes for your life? Who can bring you back under condemnation where, where, where God could be against you? Who, could bring, who, who can bring about God not being for us? And what he's saying is, is all opposition is of no account. Nothing can ever get you back into that place. Proverbs say the wicked flee when no one is chasing. They're always running and fleeing. They hear jaws. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. Why? Because God is for us. And when you know that God is for you, you're as bold as a lion. You'll go take on anything because God's for me. In fact, what we've learned is this is even deeper. God can take all the efforts, all the devices of our enemies and use them for our good. So there's people who are against you. And all God's going to do is they're his little instrument. The person who has you so hurt this morning, who ruined your life, whoever it is, that's God's instrument to say, let me cut off some flesh and make you more like Jesus Christ. Everything that we fear, all our enemies are instruments and the hand of God to chisel off sin, to polish gold, to work for our good. All evil intentions against us are tools in the hand of God to conform us to Jesus Christ. God is for us. And if God is for us, Nothing can be against us that can ever eternally hurt us and not be used for God's good purposes in our life. Just breathe. Doesn't that feel good? That's what all this gospel needs to produce in our lives. A people walking in freedom, not in fear and fretting and hearing that sound. Confident but not cocky. Confident that God is for us and nothing can hurt me ultimately. Only, only cause pain that just cooperates with God's fashioning and shaping me into the image of Christ. What could be better? I just want you to, I, I have that. He's for me. Who could be against me? And I got a whole list. And all they can do is be these instruments that God's using to make me like Christ. So if you're sitting here in bitterness or anger or unforgiveness or anything at all, all these things... Let God have his instrument to cut off flesh and change you and transform you to the image of Christ. So what happens if our government comes against us? What if a virus comes against us? What if my own kids come against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? We're going to be set apart from this whole age. Do you see what we have in the gospel? Apply it, live it by faith, logic it out, turn it over from all angles. These, just these three words 
God for us. That's the essence of faith. And you want to get practical, okay? What if a sickness comes against us? Some people at home that can't come worship with us. It's not a penalty. What if I lose my job? It's not a condemnation. What if my marriage has so much strife or that it's even ended? It's not the wrath of God. What if my child's walked away from the faith? It's not retribution. What if I spent more time at funerals last year than weddings? And I want you to get this. You'll be changed. If God is for us, who could be against us? Shall we go on? We'll just fall down on our faces and worship, pray. Well, Paul goes on, so I, I think we're going to go on as well. In verse 32, how do we know that God is for us? Like that could, I could see where that could change my life, but it's hard for me to believe it. Are there variations in his love? Because I blow it so many times. I'm insignificant. Can't my sin turn him against me? This is so challenged on a daily basis, and the scene challenges it that I need a bedrock promise to bank all my life to know that God is for us. And we are going to look at the answer, if God is for us, how can he be for us? And the answer is so beautiful. It's verse 32. 32 says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things. <laughs> so as we look at this phrase, it starts with what's called an intensive particle, and it would be translated this way, surely, indeed, he who did not spare his own son, surely, he who did the greatest thing is going to be the argument. He didn't spare his son. The lesser is, I can take care of you to get you to glory. And I'm going to show you this morning, the hardest thing God ever did was not spare his own son. And do you think he can now help you with whatever you're facing to get to glory? To let no one come against you that can ultimately hurt you and destroy you? Let's take a look at it. I want to look at it just word by word because I think this is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. Let's look first at, at he. At he. Who's he? It's been gripping my heart. He is the Father. God the Father did not spare his own Son. And we spend much time, and we should, at the cost that Christ paid on that tree of the crucifixion for our sins. There's just so much value in seeing what Christ did for us at Calvary. But I want to make sure that we don't look past the cost of the Father as well. And it's He. He gave His Son. He did not spare His own Son. I was listening to a couple guys this week. I was reading even Tim Challies, and they said that the love for a son is like no other. So my love for my wife is like no other. My love for my daughter is like no other. And they're saying your love for your son is like no other, especially one walking with God in favor and fellowship that has been infinite and eternal. The question is, who would part with such a son as Jesus? And we've got some, some young marrieds. Uh, hold that baby up just a little bit, Cammie. I mean, that's a little boy. Oh, he's sleeping. Just let him sleep, man. I'm messing with him. Um, I could just ask you guys to yell out. I mean, what happens when you hold that little guy? You, you feel something. I remember when I held my first one, it was, I'll die for this little guy. And there's an instant love that is so unbelievable. And I was brought to Genesis 22 this week where God says to Abraham, he finally gets that promised son when he's 100 years old and Sarah's 90 to bring the blessing to all the nations. Like if you want to spoil a kid, that would have been the one. Take your son, your only son, Abraham, the son whom you love, Isaac, your unique son born to you out of promise. Take him to Moriah and offer him up as a burnt offering. And Abraham obeyed. And he drew his knife and he was ready to drive it through the lad. And God said, stop, spare him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your only son. One of the most beautiful pictures in the Bible with the ram caught in the thicket to be a substitute. 
But God the Father didn't get a stop. No one said, put the sword of justice down. And so God the Father did not spare His own Son. He delivered Him up. And I want you to hear this. No mercy was given to Jesus Christ. No pardon. He pierced His own Son through with the sword of justice on that tree. And I don't think we'll ever get our arms around what God did on Calvary. So it says His own Son. It wasn't just a good man. It wasn't an adopted son. Own as his only begotten. He was not created. He's the eternal Son of God. We saw it on Christmas Eve. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. The Father said, this is my beloved Son. He's the radiance of God's glory. He's the exact representation of the Father. He was daily His delight. And Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And it's so important that we get this. This wasn't a man that he spared not. It was the eternal Son of God, his only begotten Son, the one that he loved infinitely. And Sean kind of warmed me up for Spurgeon, and Spurgeon said this, we can only love to the, to the finite degree of which humanity is capable, but God loves beyond all degree. The heart of God is filled with fathomless oceans of eternal affection that he had for his own and so God the Father, His own Son, He did not spare. These three little words are the foundation of our eternal praise and worship. Zechariah 13, 7, it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man my associate, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. So I want you to consider this. David sinned greatly with Bathsheba and Uriah, and he cried out, Be merciful to me according to thy loving kindness. Moses says, Let me see your glory, God. And the glory of God passes by and says, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. He keeps loving kindness for thousands. He forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. The glory of God is to show mercy. Because his very essence is to show grace. And so when I think of God, I think of compassion and mercy. It's the only reason I'm alive. Come to Golgotha, and this mercy that flows from God like a mighty river is dammed up. It restrained itself. It let not one drop out to Jesus when his hour was at hand. The God of mercy spared not his only son. Not one stroke, one tear, one groan, one sigh, not one circumstance of misery. Jesus said, I, I thirst, and they gave him sour wine. He looked for an earthly comforter, and they had all scattered. He looked for kind words, and he got scorn and mockery. He who did not spare his own son, the co-equal, co-eternal, co-essential son of God, he spared not. Jesus went to the garden when his time was at hand. He looked at that cup filled with the Father's wrath. He's baptized into a bloody sweat. He prays three times, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass. God heard the cry of Ahab and he spared him. He heard the cry of the Ninevites. He spared him. He heard the cry of Hagar and Ishmael and he spared him. But his own son's cry, let this cup pass, if possible. And the answer is not possible. It must be drank. The justice and the severity of God. And that last heart-wrenching cry of Jesus, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? No help. Darkness. He just keeps forsaking him, pouring out his undiluted wrath upon his own son. I won't forsake him. But, One of the strongest contrasts in the Greek, the complete opposite of sparing him, it says he delivered him up. He delivered him up to make atonement for our sins. He alone could satisfy the justice of God. And he would hang on that cross as the sin bearer for my sin. 
and the wrath of God for sin would be appeased on him and he would drain every last drop of that cup. Isaiah said, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. God did not spare him anything. And when our sins were put on him, he poured out everything upon him. He poured out the full vial of all of his wrath that we would have went to hell and paid forever. He wounded him, he bruised him, he put him to grief, and he smote him. And Jesus was utterly forsaken. And my question is, why? Why? And the answer in verse 32 is he says, for us all. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. It's not possible. Isaiah says that God was pleased. The, the Hebrew word is delighted to crush him. The father was pleased to not spare him and to crush him. He's delighted. God was pleased to run over his own son so he can now run to us and give us mercy and help in our time of need. He didn't spare him for us. The severity that was given to Christ was so the sweetest mercies could be given to you this morning. Drink that cup. God is for you. To sit in suspicion of God and questioning his heart and his ways, his motives, or his abilities to help you. He's forgotten me. How could he forget the ones that he did not spare his son for but delivered him up for us all? How could he forget you? Impossible. Back to Octavius Winslow. He delivered up Jesus to die. Not Judas for money. Not Pilate for fear. Not the Jews for envy, but the Father delivered him up for love for us and to us. He delivered him up for us all. So the application... How will he not also with him then freely give us all things? Carizo my. How will he not give us all things? God did the hardest part. He's delivered up his own son. He didn't put his sword back in its sheath as the son was praying for. Let this cup pass. We'll never get our arms around what all went on between the father and the son. But I tell you this, the father did the hardest part. And now the argument then is, how will he not give you the rest of what you need to bring to glory? This is easy. This is easy to help you with whatever you're facing, to turn your enemies against you for your good, to conform you to Christ. This is the easy part. Will he withhold no good grace that you need to make it to glory? This is, this is the easiest thing now for God. God is for you. And he'll freely give you all things. And if you look to Calvary, you never have to doubt it. And you have to get this. This is so crucial to the Christian life. Yet grace for all of these things is but crumbs under the table compared with not sparing his own son for us all. I want to read to you John Flavel, a Puritan. He said, he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? How is it imaginable that God should withhold after this, the cross, spirituals or temporals from his people? How shall he not call them effectually, justify them freely and sanctify them thoroughly and glorify them eternally? How shall he not clothe them and feed them and protect them and deliver them? Surely if he would not spare his own son, one stroke, one tear, one groan, one sigh, one circumstance of misery, it can never be imagined that he should after this deny or withhold from his people for whose sake all this was suffered, withhold any mercies or any comforts or any privilege, spiritual or temporal, which is good for them. How could he withhold when he did, when he did that? J.I. Packer said, it will tell, I'll tell you the meaning of all this, these all things. One day you're going to see that nothing that could increase our eternal happiness has ever been denied you, 
And nothing that would have decreased that happiness has ever been left from us. Conclusion. There's so much against us. In Romans 8, the world is fallen. We live in subjected to futility. We have a world, the flesh and the devil coming at us at all times. And the call this morning is to remember that God is for us because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know it because he didn't spare his own son but delivered him up for me. God will therefore do the easier thing to give me all things that I need for life and godliness on my journey to glory. And that it's absolutely certain I will arrive at its shores because of the heart and commitment and grace of God. Amen? Amen. And I just close, if you're here, don't let that bounce lightly that God is against you. And I just, I, I pray, he, he put his own son up there and what you deserved, and he, and he bore the wrath of God for your sin, that now he could be for you instead of against you. And so I, I beg you to, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, surrender to him, look to him, believe in him, and you'll be saved, and God will be for you. So don't try to keep living this life with God against you. That's why nothing works and everything's broken. So I, I offer Jesus Christ to you. Let's pray. Father, these are the sweetest words that we could ever hear. God for us. And Lord, I thank you that you sent your son into this world. And he did all that was necessary to remove the enmity, the wrath, the justice, so that you could be merciful to your, to your children, to those who would believe. And so God, we thank you for such a gift. And I pray, let every heart be overtaken with it. Let them not understand this academically. Please, Holy Spirit, open the eyes of their heart this morning to see the fullness of what this means that God is for you. Lord, overwhelm their hearts, uh, heal hurts, fears, brokenness, anxieties. Lord, that's the cure right there. God is for us. And so I, I pray, apply this deeply into their hearts and let us never get over that the Father did not spare His own Son. God, we praise You for that, but You delivered Him up for us all. How are You not going to freely give us all things that we need now to make it to glory, to, to endure all these attacks and all our enemies and all who are against us? God, we are, we are so safe and certain in the decree of God and the love of Your heart. So I thank You for this. I pray, Lord, do Your work individually now in each and every heart and bless the people of God and let any this morning come into the safe refuge, this safe place that you have made for all who will repent and turn to Jesus Christ. God, draw some to yourself even this morning to find Jesus to be a treasure hidden in a field. God, I thank you for this precious Christ and it's in his name that we do pray.